to a live episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Waldman. What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. Relax, Courtney. The show is starting now. You have not missed a second. This will be the fastest 90 minutes of your life right now. I am warning you. So if you watch the show too much, your life will go too quickly. So uh, I will leave that up to you. Daryl Cohn, before we even get going, Daryl is a world famous criminal defense and entertainment attorney from Atlanta. He does the court TV thing all the time. You used to be on TV, you were telling us, with uh, Archie Bunker, amongst others. Did you ever think in your wildest imagination that at one point in 2024, boneheads like me would be hosting a show from basically a walk-in closet in Miami Beach that goes out to the entire world? This is like a odd. Did you ever? Did you ever anticipate this? When I lived in Miami Beach, I was not blessed enough to know you, but I did live there for a while. And when I was in the state attorney's office, I didn't know you. But in 2024, we've got a Trump circus. We've got all sorts of circuses going on. And in addition, we have soap operas. We have writers from L.A. that are here and now. Can't make this stuff up. No way. You, you cannot. Look at this. Ashley, love the puffer vest. Um, I don't want to be obnoxious, but it is drop below 70. I had to go to the dog oh. park before here and... Uh, <laughs> and uh, the trade winds, the, the ocean breeze was coming off at the dog park. And uh, sorry, John, I'm sorry to do that. John, I keep telling you, you got to come down to Miami. So let me introduce the guests and then we're getting into it. This is a all Donna, all the time Adelson show. Our Timothy Jansen, top right hand corner, come to us from his mahogany wood office, which I love, is a partner in the firm Jansen and Davis that bears his name. He has done it all in the legal profession, all kinds of complex civil, administrative, and criminal litigation. Plus, he spent five years as a federal prosecutor. No one knows the Tallahassee legal community better than our Timothy. Jonna Spilbor, she is a popular, and whenever I say this, I get nervous. I'm going to get canceled, but she wrote this. She's an outspoken attorney, a columnist, a legal analyst. She appears regularly on Fox News, Fox Business. She's feisty in a good way, and she's smart as hell, and she hosts a radio show. Uh, you've got Daryl Cohen. He's an entertainment and criminal defense attorney, a partner at Cohen, Cooper, Estep, and Whiteman, LLC. He's on Court TV. I believe it's every uh, Wednesday. He also uh, represents television anchors, actors, photographers, models, talent agencies. I needed him when I was in news because all of my talent agents were – no offense to them, subpar, didn't do what I wanted him to do. Um, Tim Jansen, you were with me today. I'm going to torture uh, you, and I'm going to replay uh, today's very quick hearing. It runs about four minutes with Donna, not the entire thing, but the majority of it. But what was, what were your Cliff's notes from uh, today's hearing? Donna was back in court today. Well, we couldn't hear for the first part, but my understanding was that that Dan brought up the conflict issue. Dan asked the court to clear that issue up on the record with Donna affirming that she waived the conflict and that she waived him possibly being a witness at this point. So the judge swore her in and he talked about the conflict. Very, very uh, general conflict waiver, wasn't too specific. Um, and the state took no position at all. Uh, Jonna, I had uh, Dan Rashbaum, who was lead defense counsel for Charlie Adelson, where they lost badly with a verdict, a guilty verdict coming back in uh, under three hours. But now he, uh, Dan Rashbaum, is repping Donna Adelson. I'm going to play some of the interview to get your guys' reaction. It was this past Thursday night. Is it odd to you that the same Miami defense attorney is going to be representing the mother now in all this? extremely odd to me. And if I were Dan, I would not have taken this case. There are just too many moving parts, too many things that can go wrong. It doesn't, it just doesn't make sense ethically. He's not doing anything ethically wrong because she did waive the conflict. They both waived the conflict, but just internally, ethically, I wouldn't sleep well at night if I 
were representing her, knowing that I represented her son, knowing that things could go horribly wrong at Donna Adelson's trial. It just doesn't sit well. I wish you weren't doing it. Uh, you know, it's his decision and her decision and Charlie's decision. Good luck to them. Uh, by the way, very quick. Uh, I know it's confusing because Jonna and John Singer are on the thumbnail. I'm remaking all the thumbnails, but uh, John Singer had a last minute conflict. John Singer will be on tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Eastern time with Stephen Webster and Louis Baptiste, who are partners in a law firm. Louis was Dan's student and Stephen was Dan Markell's post-divorce attorney. So tomorrow it is uh, John Singer, Stephen Webster, Louis Baptiste. And at 5 p.m. tomorrow, uh, this is a very bizarre story out of Kansas City. Three Kansas City Chiefs fans were watching a game at someone's house, the playoff game, and were found frozen to death in the backyard. I have three, uh, two detectives and a crime scene expert coming on to discuss that tomorrow night. A very strange, very strange story. Uh, Daryl Cohen, sort of the same question to you. Uh, is it is it odd that Dan Rashbaum defended Charlie and is now going to defend, defend Donna and is for whatever reason, doing my show and perhaps doing other media now. To the best of my knowledge, this is insane. I don't understand what Dan is thinking. Uh, it's sort of not Fonnie Willis, but it's Dan. What are you thinking? The potential for conflicts waived or not or waived at is outrageous. Dan, you don't do that. I don't care what type of fee in my that she's giving him. It could be a dollar. It could be $10 million, but you don't do it. It's not something that you can come out looking good at. If it can happen, it will, and it's never good. And my feeling, my view is it's not going to be good. Look at this, Jonna. You're getting a rep here. A good one. Rock, shape, or scissors. Jonna's on, which reminds me I need my wine. Uh, we'll yeah. listen, but not. Me too. <laughs> Jonna says it's Botox wine and I added chocolate. So all right. uh, we're all on the same page. All right. Well, listen, without further ado, it is a Monday. Um, it's been a long day. I started, uh, I'm following in Daryl's footsteps. I did court TV with Julie Grant at eight this morning. It's almost eight tonight, but I'm going to play this hearing. It runs about four minutes. Cause I don't know, to be honest, if Daryl and Jonna saw it. And I don't know if all of you saw it, but it is pretty, uh, fairly short. Let's listen. This is Judge Everett at the beginning of this uh, hearing today. View is such where we're going to need another case management in the next few months, or do you think we're in a position to start talking trial dates? Judge, I, I think we'd ask for a case management sooner, maybe in uh, three weeks. Uh, I think we'll have a better idea then. Uh, the state's been working diligently with us on the discovery, um, but uh, I think we'll have a better idea in the next few weeks or so. Okay. Ms. Adelson, there is a matter that I am going to have to address with you as well concerning uh, conflicts that would be related to your counsel in this representation. I'm going to need to swear you in and take some brief testimony from you. And from there, I'll continue with the attorneys. Please raise your right hand, ma'am. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth? I do. You can lower your hand. Ms. Adelson, do you understand under the Constitution you have the right to conflict-free representation? I do. As it relates to your current attorney, Mr. Rauschbaum, representing you, you understand that he has certain duties as it relates to his prior representation with your son? Yes, Your Honor. I understand. You understand his prior duty of confidence that he must maintain under the rules of professional responsibility in some way could affect your representation. I do, Your Honor. And do you also understand in deciding whether or not to waive any conflict concerning this matter, you have the right to obtain independent counsel on that matter? I do, Your Honor. Have oh, you been able God. to discuss with independent counsel whether or not you waive any conflicts as it relates to the prior representation of your son. I have, Your Honor. And are you, in fact, waiving any such conflicts? I am, Your Honor. There is a second issue as well as it relates to the rules of professional responsibility for attorneys. 
there is another prohibition within them that deals with the matter of an attorney possibly being a witness in a case. I do not know if the state would seek to call your attorney as a witness for any matter. However, you understand an attorney cannot be both advocate and witness in the same case. I understand that, Your Honor. Do you understand as well if the state attempted to call your attorney for any reason that could materially affect your defense? I understand. Do you also understand you have the right to obtain independent counsel to assist you in making the decision as to whether or not you wish to waive this conflict or I even potential of conflict, I should say? Yes, I'm aware of that, Your Honor. And do you waive this potential conflict as well? I do. Mr. Rauschbaum, do you wish there to be any further inquiry as it would pertain to Lazarle versus State? No, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Adelson. That will conclude all testimony that I will need from you today. <coughs> Does the defense have anything that it wishes to raise this morning? No, Your Honor. Ms. Dugan, does the state have anything that it wishes to raise? No, sir. There you go. Uh, Jonna, mm. ladies first. Um, what stands out to you? I mean, it's sort of atypical in a weird way hearing, and in another way, very atypical because of all these conflicts, uh, basically like these disclaimers that the judge is reading. But what stands out to you? Well, superficially, the one thing that immediately out is that Donna Adelson looks pretty damn good for being in the clink for the last mm. two plus months. I don't know how she's doing that because yeah. my clients who are behind bars don't look that good. Uh, second, this was kind of a strange hearing, although I guess it was uh, pre-planned for lack of a better word, that they were going to discuss this whole waiver thing uh, on the record and get her acknowledgement on the record just as a housekeeping matter so that the case can go ahead and move forward. It, but again, I don't like the prospect of her attorney perhaps becoming a witness and a judge warning the client, the defendant about that and the, and the defendant waving that on the record. To me, like even the potential of being a witness would have me running for the hills, hire somebody else. I just you just don't want to go there, especially in a case as serious as this. But I guess I guess I. When I, I listened to the show, your show with um, her attorney, which, by the way. Thank you, Jonna. You're I listened to the whole thing. I have to tell you, this is a sidebar. Your skill, your, your skillful, artful questioning of him, uh, hitting hard-hitting questions that weren't softball in a, in a way that didn't get his back up and really actually got him to answer 90% of the questions you ans uh, asked of him was stellar like that that is expertise and that is skill and that was it was great to watch it from that perspective thank you his, his answers oftentimes made me cringe <laughs> at the end of the interview i could not i said to myself why is he doing this I, why why but anyway back to your question yeah this was a pretty pro forma kind of um appearance today that is just a housekeeping it was really a housekeeping appearance and uh, this is just some B-roll, obviously, Sarah Dugan, uh, who works alongside Georgia Kaplman, state prosecutor. She was there on behalf of the state. Um, Daryl, there are, I'm going to cover your face for one split second here, and I'm going to ask you the question. But there are people who say, this is Michelle, that I hope the state does call Rashbaum as a witness. How much of a real possibility is this? Because a case such as this is predictably unpredictable, I think it's a very real possibility. And think about this for a moment. He's called as a witness. Oops, he has to withdraw. He's no longer representing her. Who does she get? How much time does her new lawyer get in order to bring him or herself up to speed? None of this makes sense. It's predictably bad. I usually say predictably unpredictable, but here I'll predict it's predictably bad because there's no underlying good reason for this to happen. If she goes to trial and if she loses, then think about the appellate process. Well, he could have brought this out, but he didn't. Yes, but you 
waive that problem. No, I didn't waive the fact that he was supposed to be a real lawyer for me. I didn't say he shouldn't represent me zealously. What I said was I waived a conflict. Well, the conflicts abound. They're in hurt. They're in hurt. They're there. And there's nothing that you can do, anybody can do, by allowing him to continue to represent her. And I don't care what type of fee he gets. I don't care what type of publicity it's going to include. But it's just foolish. It just doesn't make sense. And he's setting himself up as well for ineffective assistance of counsel should they go to trial and should they lose. Unless I'm hearing plea bargain, let's see what we can do because of her age. Yeah, uh, that is, I guess, still up for debate. The question is, I guess, if they you know, work out a deal, what would that deal be? Uh, Julia Nielsen, always some lighthearted moments despite the seriousness of the topics. Can Windsor and George make an appearance? Tim, those are Tim's beautiful dogs. Windsor. Uh, Windsor. Windsor. <laughs> Look at this from Yala. Jana looks like a model. Uh, Yala said that, not Joel. Um, Joel, Joel let me ask. Joel, let me just jump in here. We do, all agree. Tim. We all agree that the conflict of prior representation of Charlie is a given. The judge did Charlie's trial. My question is, how did the judge know before trial and motions that Dan might become a witness? Did the judge listen to the jail calls where Donna is saying, Dan told me? Was there a motion filed? How did the judge know that Dan may be a witness? Is the judge watching this show? I'm curious because it didn't look like the state brought this issue up. The judge on his own brought it up. They um, brought it up I, yeah. in chambers and off the record is my guess. You know, a lot goes hap a lot happens in chambers that's not on the record. Then you come out and you put the important stuff on the record. I'm guessing, but that's not not, not with this judge. He doesn't uh, meet in chambers. Uh, judge Everett does not meet in chambers. Then you you would know. So that is so that makes yeah. it very curious. Uh, you know, I there were some people who were not happy with uh, Dan Rashbaum. Some people were not happy with me, but um, you know, I tried to come with quote unquote receipts and, and I'm going to play some of the uh, interview in a moment, but uh, there were some people that were unhappy about Dan Rashbaum appearing on this show. And I know some of them said that they actually called judge Everett's office. Uh, so maybe he did get wind of it. I don't know. Um, but you know, he also did, Dateline as well. John, why, you know, I asked him this question. Why are you here today on Thursday? Why do you think he decided to uh, come on Surviving the Survivor? You know, my answer to that has changed. Originally, when I was listening to him in the beginning until things started to go downhill for me as a viewer, I thought he was really just trying to do the best for his client and come out and give her some positive publicity because she has none. And there's nothing really wrong with that. But the more I think about it, the more I think, is he setting this up for an ineffective assistance of counsel appeal? Like, is he planning to lose? Does he figure he's got nothing to lose by doing this? So that, I mean, this would make for a great, you know, John Grisham novel. He does this on purpose so that when she gets a verdict in 90 minutes instead of three hours, of guilty that she'll have an automatic appeal and maybe she can stay her prison sentence because of her age and get out. And by the time the appeal is done, she'll be pushing up daisies naturally and not have done a day, another day in jail. Like that's where my mind goes, but maybe because I have a wild well, imagination. No, no. Cause I think other people are thinking that, uh, Daryl Cohen, do you think there's any way at all, uh, by the way, uh, Salernis Summer says Rashbaum will walk away with $3 million. We have no idea what he's getting paid, by the way, for defending the Adel. Says it a different way. Um, but Daryl, do you think there's anything to this that Rashbaum is playing some sort of 3D chess where he's coming on my shows or doing other things? And listen, Dan Rashbaum's he's a nice guy. You might not like his client, but he is a nice guy. Uh, you know, he offered he offered to come on the show. Um, he reached out. Um, but is, is he playing some sort of high level three or four D chess that, uh, we're not even aware of here, Daryl? I cannot get into his mind, but what I can get into is why, why, why Delilah is the old Tom Jones song goes. <laughs> why would you do this? Why would you set yourself up for an amazing, not looking good at best? The optics at best are bad. And should he lose a trial with Donna, who's no longer a prima donna, 
should he lose that trial, then he has absolutely set him up, set himself up for ineffective assistance of counsel. And if that takes place, does he really want the publicity? This is not a political game where either endorse me or hate me, but don't ignore me. Here, you don't want to be ignored. What he could have done is set itself up for a press conference and that way he wouldn't have put himself in the same position that he did being on your show, being on Dateline, but I would have done nothing. And I like publicity for my clients who deserve it, who need it. In this case, there is nothing in my view that he can do that can help Donna look like she should win in the court of public opinion and also in the middle of a trial. And that's a cool judge, by the way. I'm very impressed with him. Yeah, he is a uh, very cool, calm and collected uh, Judge Stephen Everett. Uh, by the way, I was wondering uh, why Alex Morris, he's the Tallahassee counsel, why he wasn't there. But Dan Rashbaum from Miami was. Turns out Alex M Morris is currently working on a uh, murder case. There's a trial going on that's supposed to last uh, another week or so. Uh, that's why he wasn't there. Tim Jansen from our friend in Chile, Vermont, Bonnie Lee Lopez and her and her pal Lexi that is her dog what does the panel feel about Rashi's comment that there isn't anything incriminating on Donna's phone how would he know uh does the defense counsel would Rashbaum already have information about evidence uh found uh in terms of digital forensics Tim well I wouldn't think so because she was stopped not that long ago and getting that stuff downloaded by an expert doesn't is not that quick uh, certainly discovery doesn't come that quick in this jurisdiction. Although, um, uh, we're a birdie told me and, you know, Dan told me that he didn't look through her phone. He looked through discovery. So I don't know. I wouldn't be looking through my client's phone to find something that's incriminating. I'm putting myself in as a witness. Now I'm putting myself in a bad position. If there's incriminating stuff there, why would I put myself as a lawyer in that position? You know, hire an investigator. Don't right. put yourself in the shoes where you're going to end up being a witness. And, and if there's something incriminating, what's he going to tell her? Get rid of it. Um, don't get rid of it. I can't tell you to get rid of it, but this would be bad. Uh, you, you, you just put yourself in a bad position and it always will come back to bite you. Always. Hmm. Uh, shout out to Nikki Cuds or Cudes. I never know which way to say it. I'm going to say Cudes from now on. Gifted 10 surviving the survivor. Uh, best guest memberships. Thank you so much. Uh, Russian Aloha with a little uh, sarcasm. I think it's great. She got the same lawyer that <laughs> lost her son's case. We'll find out how he does on this one. Again, I, I it, you know, I don't want to. You guys can do it all you want. But Dan Rashbaum, again, uh, I don't think he's a bad person. I think he's in a difficult spot. Um, is it possible that Dan Rashbaum may not have a real choice in representing this family? That's interesting, considering their M.O., Jana, um, They are known to hire hitmen. Um, is Rashbaum being extra cautious? And we're not even thinking about that. You know, no. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt, though. Perhaps... Uh, Donna Adelson went to him and said, nobody knows this case better than you. And I am only here because my son was convicted. And even though he presided over that, he, you know, he does know the facts of the case. Maybe she just felt so comfortable with him that once she agreed to waive any conflict, it was like, okay, it makes sense for me. You know, Dan would say to himself, it makes sense for me to take the wheel in this case, though it doesn't. But if that was the rationale, then I could see why he agreed to represent her. And can I also say, I don't know him at all, but just based on your interview, he does seem like a smart guy. He seems like a knowledgeable guy, a, a very experienced attorney. I'm sure he's a, a great guy. I just disagree with his professional decision in this case. That's what I'm critical of. He, he was, you know, I, I guess there are a fair amount of undefeated prosecutors, but he was a uh, prosecutor with an undefeated record of like, 30 something and oh, but uh, he's not, he's certainly not a dumb guy. I can tell you that, uh, it, that for sure. Uh, hey, hey Mona Joel, says, Yes, Joel, sir. Most, Tim. most federal prosecutors are undefeated, Joel. That's, a, <laughs> that's what I said. That's what I said. Yeah, that's because yeah. you only try the cases that you can't lose. That's right. exactly right. <laughs> with uh, with the deepest never ending pockets, right? Um, Yala here, Donna's verdict in a quick 90 STS minutes. Yes. I wonder if it'll be that fast. 
Um, so let me play a uh, piece of uh, tape here, as they used to say in the Daryl Cohen days, but it's no longer a real tape here. Um, this is me asking Dan Rashbaum. Donna wrote a completely unhinged email about dressing her children, of course, being a Jewish grandmother, dressing her children in Nazi uniforms um, to uh, get on Dan Markell's nerves. Uh, COE, you're going to let this play here? Let me see. That's here. the email. Oh, I thought there was a video here. Oh, so let me read the email. I'm sorry there, COE. Um, you have a job to get done. This is written. For, I thought this was video. We'll play the video in a minute. You have a job to get done and a very short time frame to accomplish it. This is Donna writing to Wendy. This is the actual email. That's why it looks weird. If you dressed your kids up in Hitler youth uniforms and brought them down here, I could care less. It was an act of defiance and control. It would show gibbers that he's not in control. If your children are baptized, it doesn't make them Christian. Ben and Lincoln aren't really pirates because they dress up like Jake the pirate. It's an act. You got into this mess with gibbers by being so compliant with not uh, and non-confrontational with him. If you just keep paying your attorney, she goes on $600 an hour, blah, 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 blah. Uh, Daryl Cohen, uh, your response to a Jewish grandmother telling her daughter to dress her grand her own grandchildren in Nazi uniforms. This is a little more than just an angry grandmother, in my opinion. I could not be more disgusted with that email. It is disgusting both based on history it's knowledge of what's happening now. And there's no way that I can explain in any way how disgusted and disappointed I am. And let me say this about Donna. If she is able, regardless of the evidence, to look sad, to look old, to look feeble, just maybe a jury may excuse whatever evidence the state attorney's office presents. Sometimes juries acquit or mistry because they feel sorry for the defendant. Mm, it, that's interesting. Let me actually play the, uh, so I've got a, a clip from the interview where I'm asking Dan Rashbaum about this, and then we'll get John and Tim's take on the flip side. Who's upset regarding a divorce. And I can show you multiple examples, maybe not with Hitler youth, but multiple examples where people show emotions in the worst possible ways in a divorce case. And listen, I'm a criminal defense lawyer, okay? Um, there's a reason why I'm not a family lawyer because <laughs> family law is the worst. You get emails like this. You get crazy emails like this that generally you don't get in a criminal defense case, right? It's because there is very little that brings out the emotions of people more than a, a vigorous divorce, a bad divorce. And so, Again, if you're asking me, uh, is this email the email of a rational person? I could tell you, Donna Idelson is a rational person. Is this an email that she wrote with a lot of emotion that I'm sure she wishes she didn't say the things she said? Of course, right? Was she really going to dress them up in Hitler youth uniforms? Of course not. Does this email show that she wanted to kill Dan Markell? Of course not, right? If it did, they would have arrested her eight years earlier, right? So again, I, I get it. I, I get why you uh, want to show this email. It's the same reason why the government's going to show this email. It's their start of what they claim is her motive. I get it. If I were a prosecutor, I would show it as well. But we also have to look at the context of when the email is done, what it's responding to, and again, there's nothing about violence in the email itself. Uh, you talked about puzzle pieces, but I mean, this, this is my opinion. The puzzle pieces for Donna are, are stacked against her right now. But Jonna, um, does he make a point? You know, family court is notorious for, you know, heated tempers, uh, you know, crazy custody battles. Mm -hmm. Does an email like this, you know, you, you you can't necessarily equate it to, to murder. Does he make a point there? I spent my morning in Dutchess County Family Court today. Mm -hmm. where So I can attest, and I'm there regularly, unfortunately. Yes. Is it an emotional 
playground for people who can't stand each other, who once liked each other, now hate each other? Yes. Is it extremely emotional when somebody in a black robe is going to tell you how to timeshare your children? Yes. But here's where that argument kind of falls flat for me. This is an email from the grandmother. She's not the one who's fighting for custody of the kids, right? She's she's the one fighting for custody once removed. So for her to be instructing her grown ass daughter on how to treat her ex-husband who, and by the way, why is he called Jibbers? Was he Jibbers? That's, that's something that I'd like to find out in the future. It's a derogatory name that so they had I, for him. Yeah. I, yeah, it, do, it doesn't sound like it was, um, you know, endearing. But no. for her to be kind of driving the bus in her daughter's custody battle kind of lends itself to the theory. I also watched the Dateline episode where Dan Markle's mother said, I think Donna was the, quote, architect. And this, as you said, part of the, the puzzle, this is a piece that directly points to, to what the Martell family actually believes happened. So that's a horrible email. And no, and the, and the fact that it happened in family court and people are emotional, that's not going to fly with a jury because it's just not going to fly with a jury. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that. This is, I mean, this is, and I told Rashbaum during the interview, this is not the email of someone that's upset. This is more of a demented mind. Just to go there, you've kind of have to have a twisted, demented mind. Neuropsych Xena here with the super sticker. Thank you. It is interesting that the Adelson family is so extremely enmeshed, as my mother pointed out, uh, who is a therapist. And now Dan Rashbaum appears to be overly enmeshed with Donna as well. You know, Tim Jansen, he talked, um, and I think we'll have a clip about this, about how Donna reminds him so much of his own Jewish mother and how close he feels to her. Um, how problematic, though, is this? Nazi email. And there are other emails that are fairly aggressive and unhinged. Uh, the state will obviously show these. How problematic? Well, he told you he's a prosecutor, never lost a case. He also admitted that he wouldn't play this tape uh, on this call. Uh, it's clearly it shows control, not only of her daughter, but the whole divorce and child custody. Donna was the orchestra. She was orchestrating this, telling her daughter what to do plans to and so such terrible things to do to these young boys knowing how bad it is to the father who was very jewish and um it just shows the length she would go which is consistent with what charlie did she's manipulating people behind the scenes and this email shows it right she's trying to get her daughter wendy to act a certain way so we know she did that with Charlie also because all their little coded calls. So it's very consistent with the state's theory that the mother was behind it. And, and if that's going to be Char uh, Dan's opening, it's not going to go well. Um, Daryl, you know, they're talking about Donna being the architect. This is my own um, belief. I think that Wendy was also pushing buttons early on. She was in a horrible situation. She has not been arrested uh, do you think I'm off base or am I warm? Do you think about Wendy um, kind of triggering Donna into some kind of crazy plan? I think all of them are sort of together. They were co-conspirators, if you will. Donna was obviously the puppeteer, but Wendy was a partial puppeteer. And you said she's not been arrested. I would add the word yet to it mm -hmm. because the state piece by piece is putting this together. And the people I feel sorry for are the kids. Obviously, there's a deceased ex-husband or Dan Markle, but it's the kids who have to grow up and live with this, whether their mom is ever arrested or not, their grandmother, who is a great puppeteer. The problem is when people are so involved, and this may not be a divorce, but it sort of is, but they let the emotion get in front of them and that emotion triggered this entire murder scheme. And the state is doing a meticulous job. You, we like to see murder cases. We like to see them tried. And we like to see someone or video that someone shot, killed, kidnapped, ran them over. But here, we didn't have that. We have piece by piece, very much circumstantial evidence in many ways I went to bed last night. There was no snow on the ground. And by the way, not in Miami. And I woke up this morning 
and there was snow on the ground. I did not see it snow, but David Jansen did. Sorry, Tim, I had to bring him up. He was he's a good guy. Uh, <laughs> the fugitive. So, so my view is she better watch out and she better start to shout. Joel, can we stay on this for a minute? Because Wendy is the elephant in the room. None of this makes sense. None of this murder for hire. None of my brother did it. None of my mother was the architect. None of it makes sense. Unless little old Wendy said, help me, you know, brother. I, you know, I got, I got to do something about my ex-husband. Like, why would any brother take it upon himself to off his soon-to-be ex-brother-in-law or his ex-brother-in-law without being prompted by the sister he's so close with. To me, that is the, the the missing piece. It doesn't make sense that she hasn't been arrested and they haven't come down on her hard. Why else would this whole family circle the wagons without the wagon? It doesn't make sense. And but John, she also yeah, could be fed. She, oh my God, oh my God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Somebody has to do something about him. Help me. Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, I just know from experience, I'm the youngest child and I know how to push my mother's buttons. So uh, I don't know. It's uh, if it's that far a leap for Wendy. I think she, you know, she was definitely um, a, a puppet master to some degree. To what extent? We don't know. Uh, Wolf Girl, I do not understand, Tim Jansen, how Dan Rashbaum giving basic interviews and saying nice things about Donna is ineffective counsel. Tim? Well, I'm not saying it's ineffective counsel. Um, it's not a good idea. The bar, Florida bar rules prohibit it if he's trying to um, somehow affect the jury's determination on this case at spending. I don't know how he thinks he's going to give positive spin on Donna on a podcast. Um, because of most people watching these podcasts, they hear and see information that's not going to be introduced at trial. Now, you get a high-profile case like this, and people are going to lie and say they haven't heard anything. They all have motives to get on that jury. But I don't think Dan speaking in half-truths and not telling some things I can't say is going to affect positively for Donna. And he didn't explain some of the facts that were really bad for Donna. He said, just ignore those. You know, you people are biased. Well, he's biased, too. He's coming on here talking about his client. So I don't know if he's ineffective. I don't think it's the best time use of his time at this point. He's got a case with really bad facts. Uh, Christine uh, Kebke here, if I said that right. Uh, Joel, did Dan Rashbaum, Jana, do your show for legal advice? As the flavor of the day, he gets lots of great tips and strategy from people like you, Jana, and Daryl and Tim. Do you think he was feeling out the legal community by doing this show? No, although that's an interesting take. I don't think that was his purpose. I'm still trying to figure out his true purpose. Because the other thing he said during your interview was uh, when if he were going to be invited back to the show, he's like, yeah, yeah, you know, what? I'm really not the kind of lawyer that likes to do media. But he did 90 <laughs> minutes on this show and it was a hard 90 minutes. So we're still trying to figure this out. Yeah, I hope those weren't the worst 90 minutes of his life. Uh, Malibu, yes, Jonna, Wendy Adelson was the master manipulator. She pushed the buttons and played her family. Uh, then this comment, if Donna, Daryl, what do you think about this? If Donna had remorse about what she wrote in that Nazi email, wouldn't you think she would have apologized for it years ago? One word, amen. <laughs> mm, thought you were going to say no, but yeah, there you go. Um she doesn't seem to be the uh, apologizing type. Let's uh, speaking of Donna. Um, let's go to uh, this is a piece of tape uh, where Dan Rashbaum is telling us we don't all know the real Donna. Let's hear why. <laughs> I think that uh, the world sees these people through a particular lens. I understand why they see them through the lens, but the reality is they don't know Donna Adelson. Um, they haven't been in a room with her. They haven't spent time with her. They don't know what type of person she is. And so um, they're assuming certain things. And uh, many of those things are just completely false. Um, can can you so, give us an example? Can you give us a couple of examples? Look, <laughs> I, I've spent uh, a considerable amount with, of time with Donna over the years. She is caring, loving, um, she is probably the most polite client I've ever had in 25 years of doing this. Uh, she's bright. 
but um, not analytical. Um, she's kind. Um, she's someone I like. She's someone I care about. I would go so far <laughs> to say that. Um, and that's that's odd for me in representing a client. Um, uh, but I'm going to just stop it there and then we'll pick it back up. But Jonna, this is a, uh, a client of his who is going to go to trial for murder. Um, should he be um, a little bit more careful about gushing the way he is at this point? Um, I mean, it's, it's borderline ridiculous at the way he is speaking of a woman who's accused of murder here. And, and I agree. And this was one of the portions of the interview where he did lost him. You know, sometimes I was liking him and appreciating what he had to do. And at other times I, I just couldn't figure him out, but you know, it's not a good idea. I think he's trying to humanize her. Maybe that's what he's trying to do. Is he trying to soften up the jury pool through him? Like, you know, he's a stand up guy. He was a federal prosecutor. He's a good guy, a family man. There's nothing wrong with him. Is he trying to get the jury to like her Visa be liking him. I mean, we're probably a long ways away from trial, so I don't know how well that's going to work. But maybe that's the reason why he's gushing the way he did. Yeah, let's uh, let's listen to some more. I just took it back a little bit. Here we go. Uh, she's bright, but um, not analytical. Um, she's kind. Um, she's someone I like. She's someone I care about. I would go so far to say that. Um, and that's that's odd for me in representing a client. Um, uh, but in general, what I would say to you is uh, this is a different case, right? With different viewpoints and different reasons why uh, I'm willing to answer questions about Donna. Um, because mm -hmm. I think there's there's so much there's look, there's so much out there in the seven plus years of the media covering this. Daryl, I'm going to stop it right there. He just said, this is why he's willing to go out there. Cause there's been seven years of this uh, in the media, meaning all the negative attacks. Um, he's obviously trying to defend her character, but is he lionizing a woman who is perceived to be a murderer? I mean, is he, is there a more subtle way for him to be approaching this description of hers? I guess what I'm asking. You're not talking about this woman who was going to Vietnam, had a one-way ticket. <laughs> it's not the same woman, I'm sure, because he's not describing the person that we, not knowing her personally, but seeing what her actions were. Uh, I think he's gushing, and I think he's made a mistake, and he's too close to this case, regardless of whether she is the, the mother of the person he previously represented. I think he's making, he's absolutely not seeing it, seeing the forest for the trees. He's seeing her as a person that he likes, whether she's paying him $1, 20 million, I don't care. I think he's just making a bad mistake and he's making her miss cool when she's not. She's smart, but she's not analytical. Well, if she's smart, she doesn't do what she's accused of doing, and she certainly doesn't have a one-way ticket. Yeah, that is a, a big problem. Uh, Tim Jansen, um, there's a question here from Boston Sarah. I'm going to throw it up real quick, and then I'll play the rest for you all. Uh, for the panel from Boston Sarah, do you all think Rashbaum actually believes in the Adelson's innocence in the murder, or is he operating on a don't ask, don't tell premise, Tim Jansen? Well, I, I told you last week that I thought he's too close to Donna, you know, and when you represent a family or a friend or a family member, you, you do things and say things you wouldn't normally say. You don't treat the client objectively like you need to. You don't tell a client what they need to hear instead of what they want to hear. Right. He's more acting like a character witness for her. Um, he's putting his own character and his own reputation on the line by claiming this woman's a great person, a nice person. You don't know her. Well, don't worry. The jury's going to get to know her in two weeks. And part of that getting the knowing process is going to be those emails, those calls where she's talking in code. All that's going to show oh, a picture. Code. It, wasn't, it wasn't code. It wasn't code. It wasn't no, it code. Wasn't. But, you know, it, it is code because he never, nope. she never <laughs> asked her son to bring her milk. Or any, it was always coded language, right? And no one does that. Jurors on are, are have a lot of common sense. 
They sit there in that chair and they think, okay, how would I talk to my mom? Would I talk to my mom in coded language? And now he's going to say because he was afraid of the extorter. Well, does he think the extorter has got a wiretap on his phone? It, it, none of it makes sense. The whole defense is, is not good because if they were arrested, when Sigfredo and Rivera were arrested, why didn't Charlie and Donna come out and say, hey, we were being extorted? They didn't do any of that. They didn't because they're covering up. And the reason they didn't want Harvey to call the police, because they didn't tell Harvey what they did. And that's why they kept Harvey in dark. You know, it, it's so clear. And I think the jury's going to see clearly what happened here. Yeah. And uh, I think Dan just put himself in a bad position. Um, We're going to get back to this tape in a minute. But Bonnie Lee Lopez again in Vermont. What is the panel to you, Jonna? I think uh, Daryl brought this up, which is why I'm pulling the comment up of Rashbaum's remarks about the Vietnam one-way ticket and doesn't everyone travel that way? He <laughs> does. She needed a little time away. That's all. She wasn't running. Um, that was bordering on the absurd. I mean, to me, a uh, fatal flaw for her in terms of uh, evidence presented to the jury, which, of course, it will be. Donna, why? Uh, Jonna, not Donna. Oh, my God. Uh, but, Jonna, why the hell, with a, with a family with a lot of financial means, why would she have purchased a one-way ticket not a round trip, and how problematic will this be for her? Hugely problematic. Look, this is what it is. If it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Like she was getting out of Dodge to a country that has no extradition treaty with the United States, and she had no plans to come back. If she had plans to come back, it would have been a round trip ticket. And if you just need time away, like if I look, I would like time away. Am I going to go to Vietnam? No. Am I going to go to the Caribbean or on some cruise where they feed me margaritas for free for a week? Yes. That's what I'm going to do if I need time away. She didn't need time away. She was running away. Her son had been convicted. His cohorts had been convicted. She was going to be next. And that's exactly what she was doing. It was a cold calculated move. The jury is not going to be fooled by it. And I do, you, you just reminded me of one other thing in your interview, he, Dan had an excuse for every bad fact that you threw in his face. You threw it in his face politely, but he had an excuse for every bad fact. That when you ask a jury to take an exacto knife to your case and just piece out the pieces that work for you and forget the pieces that don't, it never works. Jurors are smarter than that. They run it through their own filter. It ain't gonna fly. They don't wanna take the time to exacto knife your defense. They ju they're gonna feel it and they're gonna come back with a guilty verdict because everyone so far has been guilty and Donna Adelson does not have the facts on her side, plain and simple. Now, I don't miss New York too much, although I grew up in Jersey, New York, but I miss the personalities like Jonna. You only get those personalities in New York and I love it. Um, I'm gonna cover you up for a second, Daryl, and I'm gonna take it off so we can see that handsome face. What the heck? Yala is asking, does Rashbaum mean by not analytical? Is that a euphemism for simple? Uh, he said that Don is not analytical. I'll tell you, the way I looked at it is he was trying to defend this email. So he was saying she's not analytical, meaning she didn't sort of analyze the um, potential repercussions of writing such a disturbing email. But how did you see it, uh, Daryl Cohen? I see it as D-U-M-B. Not simple, but dumb, because she couldn't see the forest for the trees. And we talk about common sense. How often as a prosecutor did I, and as a defense lawyer, say to a jury, you've heard the evidence or the lack of evidence, but whatever you do, don't leave your good common sense at home, that which brought you up from a child to where you are now. So none of this makes sense. She, with her one-way ticket, if I'm going to get a few days to relax and maybe have an open ticket. I'm going to go to Punta Cana. I'm going to go to Cancun, Vallarta, Cabo, somewhere where I can relax and not have a lengthy trip. But, oh, my gosh, she chose Vietnam. She might be looking for the Viet Cong who might yet still be there. Who knows? Because that's the same type of absurd, really absurd explanation that was given by Dan. It makes no sense. And if it doesn't make sense, along with a plethora of evidence, it's not going to work out well for her unless, again, as I've mentioned, maybe just maybe she enters a plea of some sort or she falls upon her sword. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean any of this to happen. 
that could happen. Uh, look at Judy Sullivan. Yet another great panel. It's not just a tagline. It is our reality. Best guess in true crime. Malibu spelling it out. D-U-M-B. I uh, just want to, again, give a shout out to the COE for all the hard work behind the scenes. Space Coast on the West Coast are amazing mods who I don't like to list because I'm always afraid of forgetting one. And, of course, uh, Steve Cohen who helps book uh, the best guests in true crime. Uh, we're building something special here. Thank you for being a part of it. And by the way, uh, we've just, I'm not going to take that down because I don't want to lose a thing, but we've got another channel now, Best Trials in True Crime. I'll put it up a little later. And look at this. Jonna is the bestest guest, I think is what they're trying to say here. But let's um, let's keep playing this out and a couple more pieces of sound to go along after. Um, more particularly the YouTube media and the podcasters um, that frankly have already uh, convicted these people. They're presumed guilty um, in the public's eyes, not presumed innocent. And so um, I guess I'm up here to try to paint a different picture of them, a picture that I know to be true. I know, I know who Donna Adelson is because I, I know I've spent time with them. Uh, there you go. That was the end of that bit of sound. Um, Tim Jansen, he brought this up and he's brought this up with me um, outside of this interview that there is in this country now a presumption of guilt, not of innocence. Does he make a point there, do you think, Tim? And I'd like to get the other guest take on that. Well, you know, sometimes and I think it really depends on the crime for which the defendant is charged with. And I watch the jurors, the jury panel. And then when they say what the charge is, you look at the jurors and you see some of their faces. If, if it gets to into sexual battery or child pornography or something, you can just see them drop. And I think maybe it's not only because of the nature of the crime, but they don't want to be a part of it. Um, I hope we haven't changed our presumption of innocence. The court and the justice system does everything they can to maintain that. And that's why they're entitled to a lawyer. And and, he, and she gets to choose her lawyer and you fight and you, you have to prove it. And the state's going to accept that if you don't prove it, you're not guilty. Um, I don't think people are saying that we presume her innocent or guilty. I think they've seen the evidence and they've seen this trial and they've seen what she said and did. And I think it's a very strong circumstantial evidence case against her. And if she's going to testify, which she kind of has to now, to testify about this conspiracy, the jury is going to weigh her story and add it and compare it to the facts, just like they did for Charlie. And Charlie's was ridiculous. Um, so I hope and I pray that every time I go in court with my client, there is a presumption of innocence. But you always worry. And sometimes I can tell you, sometimes I felt that it wasn't. But that's why I fight even harder to make the state prove it. Uh, John, uh, the whole paradigm has kind of shifted. I mean, sadly, we remember, uh, you know, there used to be a time where there was newspapers and three major networks and then CNN came along. But now everyone, uh, including yours truly, uh, has shows out there that can impact a potential mm -hmm. jury. Um, has that changed the playing field? Do you think there is sort of this presumption of guilt uh, because there can be, you know, a mob mentality or people grouping together thinking, oh, she had to do this uh, without hearing everything out, which, by the way, um, in no way am I saying Donna is innocent. As a matter of fact, I think the complete opposite. However, I think that's why it is important to give people with a counter point of view, like a lead defense attorney, um, you know, a place to speak. But has this presumption of innocence or guilt changed? The presumption of innocence no longer exists. It has been so completely eroded. Anybody who practices criminal defense knows the prosecutors don't think your client's innocent. They don't presume your client innocent at all. The judge, maybe. You as a defense attorney, yes, you do. And that's why you have to go through the discovery and all the evidence with a fine tooth comb to make sure that everybody's dotting their I's and crossing their T's because that's part of ensuring that your client gets due process. But if you ask anybody on the street or ask the last jury, I picked a jury less than six months ago in a case, which we won, but that's a, another story. Every single juror that was asked, do you think that somebody who's been charged with a crime is guilty of something, maybe not that crime, of something? Nine out of 10 said yes. And that's your litmus test, right? That is America. 
That's what they think. And then you have to, if you're defending somebody, you have to get them to change their mind in the short time you have to pick the damn jury. And then you're off to the races. That's not a lot of time to change somebody's mind. You might get them to say they've changed their mind, but have they really changed their mind? Th this, is the, this is the country in which we live. This is what it's become, partly because we have 24-7 news. But let me also say this. I love the fact that our 24-7 news gets us into courtrooms that we didn't have access to, right? One of the most eye-opening cases of last year was the Johnny Depp case. People would automatically assume that Amber Heard was telling the truth if they didn't see for their own eyes what was actually happening. And we got that because we had cameras in that courtroom. So it does cut both ways, but presumed innocent, no. As a defense attorney, you got to bring the receipts or you got to know and you got to know exactly what you're doing every step of the way. The show is flying along, as I told you. Bossy Texas chick, Daryl. Uh, YouTube is the 13th juror. Deal with it, Rashbaum, followed by Coffee Cake, who says, how does she get a fair jury? How do you answer that, Daryl Cohen? Going into a trial, a defense lawyer in this day and time no longer can believe that it's fair and impartial can no longer believe the potential jurors believe his or her client to be innocent. Mm -hmm. So the best way, in my view, a defense lawyer can go into it is say that, certainly, but no, you have to prove your client's innocence vis-a-vis -vis the state or the government proving your client's guilty. It makes a big difference, not what we learn in law school, not what is portrayed, but social media everybody looks at a case amber heard jonna brought amber heard up i felt sorry for her if you notice in the beginning of the trial her hair was a certain way it was up she was condescending and haughty somewhere around halfway through the trial way too late for her she loosened up and became more credible it was too late you only have one chance to make a first impression and that's what she made and that's what she was stuck with both johnny and amber deserved Anything they got, good or bad or other, in my view. Uh, by the way, I should have Daryl voice my portion of my book because I love the guy's voice, but I don't think he's able to whine uh, the way I do in the book, so it might <laughs> not work. But just found out, Carm and I are going to be recording the audible version of Surviving the Survivor, and it's going to be ready for pre-order sometime in early March. Um, our Rashbaum, Tim Jansen from Barb here, and Donna trying to get the trial moved to miami well Any that's chance? the trial is never going to miami in <laughs> florida you have to you can't ask for a change of venue you have to try to pick a jury and only if you can't get a juror because of pretrial publicity then the judge can make that decision and if he was going to move it he's not going to move it to south florida he'll move it to an outlying county in the same jurisdiction might be pensacola might be gainesville but it's not going to miami State trials don't get moved often. I think Ted Bundy was the last one that was moved. Um, but that's a long time ago, and the laws have changed a lot and, and uh, about change of venue. But it's never going to Miami. That's never going to happen. Uh, from Wesley John Holmes, who's an Aussie living in Tokyo, to Jana, does this have mistrial written all over it with Dan Rashbaum and, to a lesser degree, a tactic uh, behind it? Yeah, that's kind of what we referenced earlier. It, uh, I would hate to think that any attorney would uh, try to plan that sort of plan ahead like that. That's diabolical, right? It wouldn't be ethical. It wouldn't be right. But is it a possibility that it's going to shake out that way? Is it a possibility that something's going to happen where he's going to end up being a witness and they're going to have to call the whole thing off? Yeah, I think that's a real possibility. I don't think um, Dan... Rashbaum, Rashbaum can orchestrate that this far in advance. And I wouldn't want to think that he would do that period, but it could happen despite all of that. Uh, from St. Mary, uh, this is an interesting point. We're going to get into this part of the, this could be the last piece of sound. And then I'm going to spend the last bunch of minutes just taking questions for these amazing guests from our, I would say, best guests, better community from our better community. Dan was not Donna's lawyer when he suggested Donna flee. He was Charlie's lawyer. So lawyer client privilege doesn't apply. Is that correct? Uh, we 
Daryl Cohen, you want to take that real quick? By the way, I was just uh, reminded that hey, Windsor. Don, Donna was um, Charlie's original. Dan was Donna and Harvey's original attorney. Charlie was represented by something else. And then he represented Charlie and got released from Donna and is now back with Donna. So the whole thing is so convoluted. But how do you answer this question from St. Mary? Well, you answer it thinking about a divorce. Was he or was he not her lawyer? Did he suggest she flee? Did he suggest that she leave? All of that becomes relevant if it goes into the courtroom. If it goes in the courtroom and the evidence is that when he was Charlie's lawyer, he suggested that Donna flee as opposed to take a vacation, there's a real problem. If on the other hand, that evidence doesn't come out, it's Shakespeare, much ado about nothing. I think that we can look at all of these nuances and the reality is very few of those nuances are going to make a difference. Very few, if any. Uh, John, back to this presumption of uh, guilt. Here's two questions. Drush, Drush Marouche, I love the name. Since the trial has received so much national exposure, even if the trial was moved to another county in Florida, what difference does it make since the case has had international exposure followed by my friend Ned Smith. In this day and age, isn't it almost impossible to find a jury who has no idea regarding a high-profile case? Uh, is there a work around it for you defense attorneys? Yeah, so I agree with that. I think in this day and age, it's impossible to... And if you do have a juror who doesn't know about a high-profile case, I don't think I want that juror. <laughs> I want people who stay informed, right, who don't live under rocks. So the key is, and this is what you have to ask in voir dire, even though they've heard of the case, you've got to explore their ability to, quote, keep an open mind. And again, this is a little bit of a farce. We ask it all the time, and it's going to depend on their school schedule. Do they have to take the kids off the bus? It's going to depend on a lot of things, whether they actually say to you, yes, I can keep an open mind and mean it, or whether they say to you, no, I can't keep an open mind because they don't actually want to sit on a jury that's going to last for a week, a month, two, or sometimes more. You know, the last trial that I had, we actually had to waive. Normally, you get X amount of jurors and then a certain number of alternates. We had to waive uh, my client's right to have any alternates because we ran out of potential jurors. Why did we run out of potential jurors? Because every single juror that could ran for the hills instead of getting seated for that jury. That's a sad state of affairs. Luckily, it worked out, but that is a very sad state of affairs. Jury duty is a thankless job. Nobody wants to do it. Tim Jansen, I just was thinking of something. If I was Donna Adelson, I think my preference would be for Jonna to defend me over <laughs> Dan Rashbaum. She's a woman. Uh, she comes across incredibly sincere. Not that Dan doesn't. But is there something to be said about having uh, a woman like Jonna defending another woman like Donna Adelson in terms of perception in a courtroom? Yeah, that's that's for sure, depending on the case and the charges and your jurisdiction. Um, Jonna would be, be great. Um, you know, and, and the whole thing about you're not you're never going to get a jury based on have you not heard about the case? Right. As Jonna said, you can hear about the case. All you've got to say is I can keep an open mind. I haven't formed an opinion. So the question is not whether you find someone who's never heard anything. You don't want that person on a jury. As I told you before, I don't want the person that wants to sit on that jury, on my jury. I want the person that wants to get off because that means they don't, they don't have an, an agenda. They don't want to really be there. They're going to take it serious and get the hell out of there. If someone's trying to get on there and answer questions perfectly, you don't want that person on your jury, okay? Um, they're not. They never had a problem picking any jury so far in Tallahassee, and I don't think they're going to have a problem picking a jury now uh, for Donna. Uh, Daryl Cohen, STS knows how to rile up my anxiety. I was just calming down. Sunday night's always my most difficult night. Every Sunday night, experience anxiety. Monday, so so. But Creative Minds has to ask this question or say or make this statement. Joel is going to end up on the stand. Uh, assure me that that will never happen, Daryl, as my attorney. As they used to say in the Miz Warehouse commercials, I guarantee it. You're not going to end up on the stand. <laughs> Should you be placed under subpoena, it would be quashed and quashed quickly, whether it's in Tallahassee, whether it's in Miami, Orlando. 
Pensacola or somewhere else. So take a deep breath. Don't worry about it. Have another or tres margaritas, por favor. Thank you, sir. I feel a lot better. From uh, Philadelphia, shoulder surgeon. Tough to say. Would the court, John, I have to determine whether the state is planning on submitting the stuff about Rashbaum so they know if he's going to be a witness. What happens if mid-trial he becomes a witness? Interesting question. Yeah, they would have to know ahead of time. And if it comes to pass that something goes awry and they want to call him mid-trial and they weren't able to give anybody notice, I think then you'd probably have mistrial written all over that because he'd have to immediately quit representing her, be called as a witness, probably invoke the fifth or some other privilege. It would be a horrible mess. And in any case, she would be unrepresented. You'd have to end that, start all over. That's going to be awfully messy. But uh, there's a there's a slim chance that that, that could happen. Mm. Uh, this is better a good off point. drinking a fifth than taking the fifth. <laughs> Uh, this is uh, a good comment here from Tia Bawa. What excuse would you have for a venue change if you were taking your defense on a YouTube tour? Uh, kind of a salient point there. Let me get rid of the comments. Let me bring up. So this last part here, uh, this was interesting. On this now sort of infamous, what we're calling a hot mic jailhouse call between Donna and Charlie from the time Donna, uh, Charlie was convicted on November 6th before Donna's arrest on November 13th. Donna is speaking on a call. She thinks that she's hung up. She is not. And she says, Dan isn't sure we're going to make it out with everything going on up here, but it's worth a try. Presumably speaking about Dan Rashbaum giving advice on fleeing. I asked Dan about it. Let's listen. After speaking to Dan this morning and knowing what they're thinking up there, I don't know if we'll make it out in time. I really don't. But Dan said, you might. Or you might do all of it, get to the airport, and they'll stop. And that could happen. It could happen. I don't know. But it's worth a try. Uh, Dan, I got to say, this doesn't look too good either, what they call a bad fact. Um, from Patreon member Bobby, is it you uh, that she is referring to? And did you have prior knowledge of her flight? So uh, I'm going to read what I've written here so I don't screw this up. Um, so. Uh, because I anticipated this this question would come. Uh, I can't talk about what I said or didn't say uh, because it's privileged. Uh, what I can say um, is that at the time Donna Adelson went to the airport, she was a free woman. What I can say is there was no indictment to anyone's knowledge. We know now there wasn't one. Um, there was no grand jury that we knew was convened. We know now it wasn't convened till after. Uh, and there was no arrest warrant that was known of. In fact, uh, we know the arrest warrant, I think, was just obtained hours before the flight. Um, uh, again, let's stop it right there for a moment. Jonna, um, mm -hmm. I asked him if that's him uh, talking about giving some advice on fleeing. He had to pull out a prepared statement. That doesn't mm -hmm. look good in my eyes, especially for an attorney. How did you how did you uh, view this exchange? here's what happened. He and Donna had a conversation. And as he's pointed out in his written statement, she was not indicted. She was not under arrest. She, there was no warrant out for her. She was a free woman. So he mm -hmm. sat down and had a conversation with her that went something like this. You're a free woman. I mean, I can't tell you to leave the country, but if you wanted to leave the country, you could give it a try. I mean, if I were you, I would do it before uh, they issue an arrest warrant and that could come at any time. And I might want to think about maybe finding a place where there's no extradition treaty if I were you. But I can't tell you what to do, Donna. I'm just saying that if that were me. That's how that conversation went down. And she took his advice, which wasn't advice. It was a hypothetical. And she went and she bought her ticket. And sure enough, the heat came down on her because of her own stupidity. But that's how that went. He's not going to get in trouble for doing that because she was at the time a free woman. She could have traveled anywhere she wanted to. Now, was he privy that maybe things were swirling? Of course he was. But at that moment, nothing was. So he didn't do anything wrong. He probably should have passed on that question, Joel, if you ask me. He should have said, yeah, I'm not I, I don't. I'm not at liberty to answer that. Let's move on. That's what he should have said. But he did. I guess to his credit, he answered it. But uh, Tim Jansen, do you agree? Was it a mistake to even answer that question? Uh, some people say that Donna threw him under the bus, but uh, look, Philadelphia's uh, <coughs> PSS here. What happened is Donna Adelson just screwed him. 
uh, well, metaphor. You know, clients me. always say the lawyer said something and they usually don't get it exactly right what the client, the lawyer told the client. He clearly is saying right now it's protected. It was under attorney client privilege. So he's saying that I was acting as her attorney giving her advice because otherwise it would not be privileged. Um, and of course, if she didn't have warrants out and he didn't know as an officer of the court, but what did he know? He knew that Georgia said, stay tuned. We're not done yet. He heard the evidence at trial, which was clearly going to inculpate her. It really looked bad on her. Probably not a good idea to give that kind of advice because it always comes back to haunt you. And now he's in this position. He's got to get an ethics opinion uh, while he's doing his PR tour, what to say, what not to say. Um, and, and you know, like Daryl said in trial, things could happen where they may think they can only win this case by having him explain what he told her. Because if that consciousness of guilt inference is given to the jury, they might need a witness to undercut that. And who's the witness? Dan Roshbaum. There you go. Uh, one other question before we play out the rest here. I'm going to cover your face for a moment, Daryl. I apologize. If Rashbaum knew the grand jury was convening, uh, if Rashbaum knew the grand jury was convening imminently, is he possibly in trouble, Daryl Cohen? W-O-W. If he knew, yes, but there's no reason at this point for us to realize or believe that he knew, at least based on the evidence as we have seen it. But he also has put himself in an untenable position. He needs to get out and get out now before anything else continues. My view, if I were being paid. There you go. If Dan's listening, coming from a smart seasoned attorney, let's play this part out. We know now there wasn't one. Um, there was no grand jury that we knew was convened. We know now it wasn't convened till after. Uh, and there was no arrest warrant that was known of. In fact, uh, we know the arrest warrant, I think, was just obtained hours before the flight. Um, uh, again, she had offered to surrender at any point in time from 2016 on. Uh, I know that because I had made uh, that offer. Um, she did nothing wrong by going to the airport. Okay. Now I cannot tell you what I advised her, what I knew or what I didn't know, but what I can tell you for certain is that I acted within my ethical obligations. Um, and what I can tell you for certain is that no crimes were committed by her going to the airport. And that's why she wasn't charged with any sort of crimes related to that. Um, that's what I can tell you at this point in time. And Dan, you're going to see some of the. Jonas Bilbour, uh, does he make a point? No crime was committed. That's why he wasn't arrest, arrested. Uh, but obviously, this is going to be brought up in front of a jury and the optics are horrific, I think. You know, there's his exacto knife again. And and he probably is correct. If there wasn't an arrest warrant, there wasn't a grand jury convened. Yeah. Could she have gone to the airport and, and gotten a one-way ticket without being uh, arrested for that act in and of itself? Yes. But what is really bothering me is when you're representing a client and you got to come and explain your own actions as a lawyer it is not good. That is worse than any sort of egg you can have on your face. And not only that, it detracts from what you are getting paid to do if he's getting paid. It detracts from your job and that's defending somebody else, not defending yourself in connection with the person you're defending. And I also don't like that he slipped in there. You know, John offered to surrender herself many times since 2016. Yeah, well, those times probably happened before her son was convicted of murder because after he was convicted of murder, I think Donna's tune changed, understandably so, I imagine. Uh, Rashbaum also said that uh, Harvey and Donna were um, very willing to speak to police, uh, but they weren't asked, and a lot of people don't buy that part of it either. But Mandy Strong here says, uh, Dan said there's nothing illegal, illegal about traveling, a one-way ticket. To Vietnam is not traveling. It's not his favorite word. It is relocating, followed by this. Uh, if Dan has to withdraw Tim Jansen, 
does this affect the court's ability uh, to give a speedy trial? I would think yes. Um, yes. Uh, now, unless she waves it and wants to go with Alex Morris and, and continue with her speedy trial if she requests it. Um, in this case, it's, it's going to be a strong circumstantial evidence case. We all know that. And what is the cherry on top? Consciousness of guilt, evidence of flight, international flight to avoid prosecution and extradition. They've got that. That means the jury is going to be told you can infer guilt from her conduct, fleeing the jurisdiction somewhere without ext extradition. You can infer guilt. That's a strong instruction. No defense lawyer wants that being given because it's hard to overcome. And now if you got a lawyer who was giving advice, it just muddles everything up. Mm -hmm. uh, from Elf, a super sticker. I'm going to have Daryl take this one. Daryl, will it be in disclosure or on a witness list if the state is going to call Dan Rashbaum to testify? When would we know that? The answer is yes, but as Jonah has mentioned earlier, yes, but if in the middle of the trial something happens where the state believes it's imperative, we weren't going to do it, but we now need to call Dan as a witness, that's when we have a problem. We likely have a mistrial or possibly we have a delay in the trial until Donna is able to secure an additional attorney. It just muddies the waters even more. And Muddy Water was a good guy, but this Muddy Water is not. And I'm worried that we're not going to have a fair trial or any trial at all because it's going to muck it up, if you would. And Joel, can I add something to that? 100%. 100%. Muddy Water, think about this. We don't, Dan doesn't need to be responsible for advising his client whether or not she should take the stand based on whether it's going to save his own ass. In other words, if she doesn't take the stand, then this flight evidence might not come up, or at least she's not going to be able to say, well, Dan told me I could go because you know that's going to come out of her mouth if she takes the stand and testifies. And he's insinuated that she is going to take the stand and testify. But now he's got to make a choice. Do I save her or do I save me? This is another reason why an attorney should never put themselves in the position that he's in right now. And this is another reason why John is great on the show because she makes these really intelligent points that I would never think of, but I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not supposed to think of them. Uh, May Love, where is Harvey now that he is free from Donna's oppression? <laughs> Hope he is clubbing uh, here. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Uh, Tim Jansen, there's a question oh. in a question here from Joe Indy, Joe Indy. The Adelsons yeah. are kind of a cash cow for Rashbaum. We don't know what he's getting paid. Who knows? But they love him because he indulges them. But I'm wondering, is there something to that? Because he does, you know, he even said how much he likes Donna, how much she reminds yeah. him of his mother. Is there a comfort factor here for the Adelsons? But maybe they're making a mistake by being comfortable with a, a lawyer that maybe they shouldn't want to be that comfortable with maybe they need a different attorney well it kind of reminds me of larry flint i don't know if you remember larry flint <laughs> yeah, of course larry i do flint. i won't you know, admit it but yes i do his lawyer tried to quit and he said i'm quitting he goes you can't quit i've got unlimited funds and i'm always in trouble and the lawyer <laughs> goes you're right i'm staying on <laughs> he had a cold wheelchair i think what's that Tim, was his first name Hirsch, the lawyer? You know what? I, I can't remember the name, but I remember the situation. It was so fitting. I think Dan, Dan has put himself in that position. He's so close to the family and Donna. She trusts him um, that she doesn't want to go to someone else brand new. He doesn't want to leave because it's a good fit, and he knows the case, and he's getting paid well, I'm assuming. But he's, he's tangled a web that – can hurt him and the client on the trial. And we're going to see this on a 3.850 ineffective assistance of counsel down the road. No doubt about it. Uh, by the way, STS in the remaining few minutes, put those capital cues. I'll go to the bottom of the chat and I will get questions to the best guests. I told you it will be the fastest 90 minutes in your life. And I was right. Uh, Pegasus 499 super sticker. Thank you. Do you know if Donna purchased proper, uh, property in Vietnam. And if she did, can it be confiscated or was it turned over to Wendy? <laughs> as far as I know, they did not. Daryl, would we ever know the answer to that? If that, um, it, the state, if the state got that evidence, would we know the answer one day? 
at the best, it's a definite maybe. It's very unlikely she purchased property because we would know she'd have to use some means to purchase it, whether it's Venmo uh, for $5, is it by tra transfer of funds? I don't think we'll ever know, but it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because if and when she's convicted or enters a plea of guilty, she's toast without butter. <laughs> There you go. Love Daryl Cohen. Um, Jonna, another big problem. There's a couple of big problems, but one of them is on these wiretaps shortly after the now infamous bump. That is where an FBI uh, agent goes and basically pretends to be a gangbanger and asking Donna Adelson for money. Uh, this is what D Dan Rashbaum called the second extortion. Uh, but it played uh, beautifully for the FBI because right after this, Donna and Charlie are heard on wiretaps. And when asked about it, um, by the way, they're using another code word a lot of the times using the word patient. But when asked about who this bump guy was, Charlie kept asking a million questions and he wanted to know who it was affecting. Uh, and she says, Don Adelson says, probably the both of us. And they're speaking in code. Uh, is that a problem when they play that for the jurors? Well, first of all, it wasn't code. They were talking in disguise, which is <laughs> apparently going to make a big difference for the jury because that's what Dan Rashbaum said. Disguise not code, yes. Um, here's the thing. Of course, it, again, another bad fact. It's not going to sit well for the jury for a couple of reasons, not the least of which is a jury, again, runs all this stuff through their own filter, and it's going to say, well, wait a minute. If I'm uh, in jail, accused of a crime I didn't commit, and my mother gets stopped, uh, my 73-year-old mother gets stopped on the street by a big thug who wants, I don't know, five grand or whatever he wanted from her. First thing I'm going to say is, oh, my God, you need to go to the police. This is another extortion. We can't let it happen to you, Mom. But that's not what they say. They say, I mean, you can tell that these two are in cahoots. And now that he's been convicted, it's going to be a, a short trip from swearing in the jury to getting that guilty verdict against her, unless there's more out there that we don't know about. But these two were thick as thieves. And, you know, and Wendy too. I don't know why Wendy gets to testify in everybody else's <laughs> trial, but then gets to, you know, go to yoga. I, I don't get it, but we'll see. A hundred percent. Great point there. Uh, Tim Jansen, do you think uh, calling so few witnesses is actually a negative for the defense's chance of winning? Well, you want to call someone that's going to help your case. And a lot of times you don't have many people out there that are going <laughs> to help your case. So when you tell the judge, I've got a week, a week testimony, you usually got about a day and a half. And I think the only witness they're going to call is going to be Donna. Because the only person that can talk about a conspiracy what she was feeling is Donna or Charlie. Charlie's got an appeal. He's not coming in there. He's not having immunity. He's not coming in there going to risk his appeal to help his mother. Um, and neither one of them came forward to the police to talk about this so-called extortion. It was conjured up at the last minute to try to cover all the pieces of the puzzle that were damning to the defense. And now, when uh, Don is going to have her piece at the puzzle and we'll see how she does on the stand. Um, it's curious. So if you saw the bump, how she reacted, she didn't react like most people would. They'd be startled. They'd be upset. She took the note, put it in her purse and she walked to get her grandkids like nothing happened because she was programmed. She already knew they'd been doing this for years. They've been talking in code. They knew what they were doing, and that's going to hurt her at the, try, at the end because it shows a pattern of a contempt and criminal acting. Uh, well put. Um, one of the other things, Daryl, that stood out to me, and then we'll get to this question for uh, Jonna, but you know, the arrest video is out there now. There's body cam footage of uh, the FBI arresting Pat Sanford, who's been on the case all, the year, all these years, arresting Donna uh, on the jetway on her way to uh, Vietnam. She never once says, I didn't do this or I'm innocent. Is there anything to be read into that? Or is it just a chaotic moment? And I'm thinking, and I'm overthinking it, Daryl. I think it's a chaotic moment. She expected at some point in her life to be arrested. She just hoped it wouldn't be now because if it's not now and she's on that plane, 
up, out, and to Vietnam we go. So that hi, big guy. So no, I don't Windsor. think they had meant anything at all. Say Look, hello to everybody. I, I'm seeing this trial very <laughs> similar to a football game I saw last night. Donna is on the bottom. There's been a fumble. And she's reached for the fumble, and there's piling on and piling on and piling on, which is what this evidence is. And somebody came out with a bad knee, but it didn't matter because Donna's the one who recovered the fumble, but she is the one that is in trouble with Dan being her lawyer. And she'd be in trouble whether he was her lawyer or not. It wouldn't make any difference in my view. Mm. Uh, the question there I wanted to get to, and then we'll get to the super sticker, but Jonna, do you think Wendy is – preparing some sort of defense already uh, in anticipation she could be the next Donna. She's been preparing a defense since day one. I think, it, I forget, maybe it was during your interview, yours or Datelines, where they show a text from her where she is basically creating her own defense in this text. Like she's a lawyer too, right? She knows, she knows what not to say and what to say. That's why she's keeping a low profile, except for the fact that she was driving toward the crime scene on the day of the crime scene. And it's like, oh, cops, I didn't, I didn't think anything of the cops. Like, what the fuck? But yeah, so, yeah, no, she, uh, she's been preparing to cover her butt since day one. I think she probably should be a little scared. I mean, at any moment, I don't foresee it happening, but it could happen that maybe mama turns on her. Maybe brother Charlie turns on her. Maybe somebody else turns on her. I mean, when, if this is the kind of life you lead, you got to sleep with one eye open all the time, whether you're in Vietnam or not. And I think that's, that's uh, Wendy's fate right now. Uh, that is a very scary fate. I would not want to live in those shoes at all. But speaking of that, um, Daryl Cohen, it could be a really awkward situation again for Dan Rashbaum, exactly speaking to what John had just said. What if there was some sort of deal that they wanted to make between Charlie and Donna or Donna and Charlie uh, about Wendy? And then you've got Dan Rashbaum, who was representing both of them. Doesn't it get really odd in that situation? Uncomfortable? It doesn't get odd. It becomes more odd and more <laughs> unreal and more <laughs> unbelievable. In that situation, not only should he have already gotten out of the case and another lawyer or two jumped in, but that would happen immediately because under the scrutiny of the court, under the scrutiny of the state attorney's office, under the scrutiny of the court of public opinion, oh my gosh. Mm. Uh, Courtney R. here, Tim Jansen, would Wendy and Harvey, if he gets that done at the club early enough, would they make it to Vietnam if they left tonight? You think there's eyes on them? Is there some sort of system in place if they, to arrest them if they were to, to flee? What do you think? Well, unless they found something on the stuff they searched at the house, the computers or the phones, they the state attorney came out and said we didn't have enough to arrest Harvey at the at the airport. Okay, so they don't have enough to arrest Harvey. They haven't arrested Wendy yet. I don't know if they have more information, but Jack did say we have more information than what we released. And I guess the question everybody wants to know is if they had enough, why wouldn't they have charged Wendy? Now, some of the stuff that's been introduced in these trials is is very damning against Charlie and Donna, but it can be considered exculpatory towards Wendy. Um, so the state has the issue of, we're going to play this that looks bad against Charlie and Donna, but it looks favorable for Wendy. So I guess they're waiting till they feel they have enough. And I think if they have enough, they will arrest her. But um, it, it, does, it hasn't happened. And I know Georgia doesn't like Wendy, and you've seen that in her demeanor during the trial uh, when she was questioning her. And she took great insult when Wendy said, you can't arrest me. I didn't do anything. And you, you look at Georgia's face, it was a challenge to Georgia. She's not one you want to challenge. There you go. That's a mic drop right there about uh, Georgia. I am not T-Pain, uh, one of our mods, the meme queen. Uh, final question, and then we will wrap it up with final thoughts to Jonna. This is a great point. If Donna is capable of offering a million dollars for Wendy to bribe Dan, this is Markel, to give up custody of the kids, uh, do you think the jury is going to be able to think that Donna is capable of hiring hitmen for far less money? Oh, 
Definitely. And I also think the jurors should be smart enough to know that how dumb were those hitmen that they didn't <laughs> hold out for a million bucks when they knew that was on the table, the stupidest hitman on the planet. So, yeah, I, you know, there has been nothing so far that we have seen in the public. And I, I realize we're not seeing everything that makes Donna any sort of a sympathetic character. None of, she's not the doting grandma, especially when you read those emails and, and the code she's not talking in. It's, it's a really tough case to defend uh, if you're her attorney. And he's made it tougher on himself. Daryl Cohen, uh, he is now a uh, friend of the show, a best guest. He's an entertainment and criminal defense attorney, part a partner in Cohen, Cooper, Estep, and Whiteman uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. You see him on court TV all the time. The guy was also a seasoned actor. Daryl, your final thoughts today. <laughs> I enjoy being with you guys. I think Dan needs to say goodbye, and he needs to do it quickly before he's forced into it because he's put himself in a completely untenable situation, not by accident, but by design. And I hope it wasn't by his design. His, mm -hmm. The publicity he's getting is not worth what he's putting himself into. Well said. Uh, John S. Billboard, who's always well-spoken, a popular and outspoken attorney, a columnist, a legal analyst appearing on Fox News, the Fox Business Channel. She has her own radio show. She's a defense attorney. She's in court. She was in court today. She does it all. How she does it, I don't know. Plus, she's got the best staircase game in the business. Jonna, your final yeah. thoughts. Uh, this is really going to be a tough road to hoe for um, Dan. And I think that if the prosecution made one misstep in this whole quagmire of a case, it's that they probably should have arrested Charlie, Wendy, and Donna all at the same time. That would have put a little pressure on this whole group after they got their convictions on the dumbest um, uh, hitmen on the planet. And, and that would have really maybe gotten to the truth a little bit faster than we're going to get to the truth at this pace. Uh, I agree. John is freaking awesome by acquired taste. Bonnie Lee Lopez, best guess. It's not just a tagline. Tim Jansen, he's a partner in the firm that bears his name, Jansen and Davis, uh, up in Tallahassee. No one knows the Tallahassee legal community better. He also spent five years as a federal prosecutor. Tim, what is next? Don is back in court February 12th. I know you're going to be with me 2.30 in the afternoon on February 12th uh, for the next hearing. I think that's about three weeks out. Uh, Tim, what should we expect at that hearing and your final thoughts? I think that um, at that point, I think they might ask for a trial date. I think they're getting things lined up. They want to see what discovery is out there, and they're going to ask for a trial date. You notice they didn't want to waive speedy trial. They did everything not to waive speedy trial. Um, I want to answer one question. Windsor is a mini Bernadoodle, a Bernese mountain dog, and a poodle. They keep asking, so... He's a crazy dog. Beautiful so dog. Um, what about this question right here, John? Don't they need Wendy to testify in Donna's trial? Are we going to see that? Oh, are we going to have Wendy testify yet again? This time against her own mother? Uh, I don't. That's a good question. I, I would say, why not? She's testified in all the other trials so far. But again, very dicey because Wendy should be sleeping with one eye open. I'm not so sure. I, I'm not going to put any money on that one yet. But don't you think, Joel, there's a little animosity between Wendy and Donna right now. They are not liking each other. And this is why I think and that there could be a deal. They might know they might call Wendy to the stand to put it to her mom. Right. Because mm -hmm. what's more effective than calling a family member to give bad testimony against a defendant or mother? And then how is how is Donna going to respond? You know what Donna would do? Donna would take the stand and throw her daughter under the bus. Right. That that might be the evidence that the prosecution needs. Oh, right. this is going to get nasty. Could. Right. They well, all can go down. And again, it's the kids who suffer the most. No yes. one else. Yes. And uh, Daryl, I'm very glad you said that uh, Alec Murdoch in the trial was, oh, what a tangled web we weave uh, here. Lori's thrive. How will all these kids process all this? Not only do you have Ben and Lincoln, uh, Markel, uh, and they go by Adelson, of course, Dan's children, but you've got Charlie's child, young child, and you've got the hitmen's children, too. Someone wrote to me, all these kids are victims, uh, whether your dad's a hitman or a uh, you know a legal scholar, you're still just a child, and no one deserves this. So, um, 
it is horrific uh, for the kids. They are obviously, aside from Dan Markell, the biggest victims in all this. Listen, this is uh, one of the best panels that I can recall in a long time. Thank you uh, to you three. Thanks for hanging out with us this past Friday. We tried to do a watch show. It was a bit of a disaster. Um, <laughs> that was for Patreon members and YouTube members. And then the COE and I decided to eat um, nachos and chips. And our kids <laughs> okay. were lunatics. And it devolved into utter chaos. So if you become a Patreon and YouTube member, you too can watch us eat chips and nachos and watch my kids accuse me of things I have done uh, that I didn't really do. Uh, with that said, love you, America. Thank you, best guests. Love you, Atlanta, Georgia. Love you, Poughkeepsie, New York. Love mm -hmm. you, Tally, Tally, Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, justice for Dan Markell and everywhere that I missed. Uh, we love you too. Till next time.